Today we have Marie McEachran and Mark Jessup from Calgary and a number of visitors from Calgary in the audience today as well. So thank you everyone for coming and I give you Marie. Hey, thank you everyone for attending this and uh, thank uh, the Ukrainian Cultural Center for hosting this event and also for to Fan and our fellow artists here for attending. So I'm just going to go right into my talk, which is about mark making and fiber art. And marks surround us. It's a term used to describe the different lines, patterns, and textures that we as artists use to give a vis visible um, view of our work. Um, each artist eventually over time develops their own gestural language and a style of their own. Marks can be descriptive, expressive, conceptual, or symbolic, and they can also be made for the fiber artist on paper or cloth. Tools used to um, make marks include thread, uh, either hand or machine stitching, pens, fabric markers, which is one of my favorites, as well as paint and also thickened dyes. Uh, it can be applied with brushes, uh, tools, household items. Characteristics of marks, um, so they include, and at, later on we'll just look at some of this work because there's lots of marks symbolized and used in all of this art around us. Uh, shape, so uh, the biggest mark in um, Threads of Hope is the red line that connects all of these art pieces and it's uh, quite stunning. This is the first time we've had the opportunity to see it in person and it's um, beautiful. Uh, so going back to characteristics of marks, shapes, which can include um, circles, squares, dashes, lines, can be regular or re irregular, separate or continuous. Uh, scale, so from very small microscopic to very large. Uh, form, either flat or raised, which can depict texture. Color, the red here. Um, direction, position, and location. So marks can be in one location, one direction, or many, or radiating, uh, and parallel, and either convergent or divergent. Um, there can be spaces between them, or they can be layered. So um, I'll just um, talk about some of the work here that um, have marks that can be used as examples. Uh, so in my piece in particular, I used um, text and paint to make my marks. So I used, um, and it was the first time I'd used text like that and paint to make words. So those are my marks. Uh, Sharon also used uh, text in hers, with lots of text throughout her work. And found the new berry. Uh, the most prominent marks that were used in this exhibit, other than the red line, was shape. And so I'll just talk about some of the shapes used and then the artist. So Linda Ingham used triangles. Nancy Rimersma, Rimersma used the bear's paws. Um, Jan Scrubs. I use hands. So the hands really depict a significant mark and meaning to Jan's work. Uh, Janet Parker used leaves in her. That's over there. That's Janet's. Um, Annette Cameron used a snowball shape. Oh, it's the red ones. Uh, first one in. And it's very interesting um, how the shapes and marks of that shape tie the work together. Uh, Susan Selby, which is just three down, uh, used the small squares to depict flowers in hers in the red. 
Blonde Carlson has people in hers, and Judy Leslie had keys in hers. So cool. Uh, and then there's um, the other marks are scale and line. And Terry asked you, asked me had the circles, the different sizes, and then the curved lines connecting all of her work. Uh, Krista Zegers, I used both color and direction, so the colors of the ribbons in hers and the direction. Then the last um, marks that were used were stitch, and quite a few artists used that. Uh, Linda Van Gastel used thread painting exclusively for her image of Terry Fox. So that's uh, quite amazing how it, it's the stitch that makes the marks, but it becomes a whole image. Um, Shell Hine, which was the third one in, also used uh, both stitch and writing to make her marks. So um, she used pen to write out her words. And then in the background, she also used stitching to make the marks. Um, and there's several others who use stitch quite um, quite a lot. Well, all of us as fiber artists use stitch in our work to make our marks. So I just brought some more samples because I'm really now really into mark making. And so this was a practice piece, but I think it, it just shows. The back is uh, paper with different kinds of pens and marks. And on this side is um, cloth with both um, stitch and writing and marking. This was just a practice piece, so it's not great, but it sort of gives you the idea of different marks. This is um, a scroll I made. So on one side is um, painted canvas. Uh, with marks and paint and stitching and removal on top of it. And on the other side is uh, painted cloth with more marks. And then uh, dyed fabric. So this is with um, acrylic paint and mono printing. I've used part of it. <laughs> Uh, As we should. Yes. <laughs> Try to use up the inventory. This is an indigo dyeing, so with um, stitch and mark and resist. Tell us how you did that, just for. I did this by folding it like this, and then the stitching takes a long time, so running stitch, starting there and each area out more. So pulling the stitch really tight, and so it's double-sided, and then putting it into an indigo bat die, and then you get two for the price of one. But, and then depending on the stitching you use and how you do your stitches, the patterns come out differently. And then a group, our little Spectra group, one year we were dying, and each artist contributed um, their own marks <laughs> to this piece and then we cut it up and our challenge was to make something out of it, which hasn't happened yet, but this is a, a piece of cloth with at least nine artists' contribution in it. So for me, this is very special because all of my friends contributed their own personal and unique mark and color. So that's the end of my presentation, and I'm, if anyone has any questions. So Marie, I have a question. Are there some marks or some tools that you did while you were doing this class that you have now determined that you're, they're not your thing? Um, can I answer it? The ones I determined are now my thing. Sure. <laughs> so my favorite discovery, they're called Posca markers and they're acrylic paint in pens, and the tips are vary from very wide, like over an inch wide, to very fine. And you can apply it to fabric or paper, just like you would acrylic paint, and you can build up layers with it and write on top of others. 
I don't know if I have any of my pieces. So that's my favorite. I'd say my least favorite, there are some marking pens that really run on water or on fabric, and so they become very blurry. But my new favorite discovery is possible markers. Like I really like the really, really wide ones. They're very neat. I like credit cards. Yeah. <laughs> for dipping the paint because you get those nice straight yeah. paths. Yeah. yeah. Hotel cards. Are those are those pens um, the the inks in them or paints in them? Are they at all transparent or are they just solid? The ones they're more opaque. Yeah. They're not very transparent at all. But they do really build nicely layer on layer. Okay. Mark well, is a member of BAM, Fiber Art Network. We know about that organization. Also a member of SACWA. S is for studio, studio artist, quilt association. Okay, thank you. And CQA, Canadian Quilters Association. There you I know go. that one. Okay, and many guilds. She's won many prizes in the different shows she's entered. Good stuff. And she's been juried into the Canadian Quilt Wikimedia. Association and the International Quilt Show in Houston. In 2016, she was named Quilter of Distinction at the Festival of Quilts in Calgary. So for those of you who head down to the park in Calgary. Uh, Mark's work is very personal based on family, friends, and favorite places. She's known for her cheery and inventive quilts, bright colors, and unique style. She likes trying new techniques and her work is always evolving. Other creative pursuits, there are many including felting, knitting, weaving, pottery, and stained glass. There you go. So, Marg has tried so many things, and it's always interesting to hear what she's learned about each of those explorations. Marg. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Well, I have to talk about my process. And Trudy said, <laughs> how long can you drag out I wing it. <laughs> and I thought, oh great, okay. So, I didn't know who I'd be talking to. I don't know why I didn't know, but anyway. Do you ever go to a quilt show or see something on the internet or whatever and you just go, or in a magazine you go, I could do that. But then you go, well, if I did it, I'd do it differently. <laughs> and that's automatically how I think. Whereas, you know how other people you know will say, I wonder where they got the pattern. <laughs> or where can I get that pattern? I'm going, I'm going, just look at it. <laughs> there you go. So the reasons to make a quilt. I'm definitely a quilter first, right? So you do quilts to give, wedding anniversaries, babies, whatever. Quilts to show. So there's the local quilt show, there's CQAs, sometimes you're trying to get something to Houston or Birmingham, wherever you are. <laughs> and um, you know, places like that, and uh, you, I, I tend to try, I don't have a theme, I don't have a, you can't look at my work and say, oh, that's a Margaret quilt. You can say that isn't a Margaret quilt, but you know, these are Margaret quilts. I, I like all these techniques, I do all these techniques, they're kind of fun. But um, I tend to try out uh, my latest thing, not my latest thing, but one of my latest things has been cheesecloth quilts. I've been tr working with dyeing cheesecloth and cutting it up and making portraits and leaves and trees and stuff. Um, I like to try out stained glass, watercolor. Remember when all this stuff came in? Collage. I'm good at collage quilting. I love, I have my own style. I, I just go with it. Paper piecing, hexagons, applique. I don't do real applique. I'm allergic to hand quilting, just so you know. Um, Bargellos, confettis, crip. And then the other times you just do, is it a gilt quilt? You know how sometimes you have to do that gilt quilt? Oh, you've never given me a quilt, or I've never had a, you know. Or everyone's doing this challenge, why aren't you doing this challenge? You just go, I don't want to do that challenge. It's a, you know, whatever, squares. It's a tape table runner, whatever. And then there's and then there's the challenged quilts. I love personal challenges. My my daughter-in-law came to me once with a Franklin Carmichael. You know Franklin Carmichael, a group of seven, 1929. He did this beautiful painting. Went at Mary Lake. She says, "Can you make this into a bed quilt for me?" I love challenges like that because of course I can. You know, like 
just have to think about it for a minute. And I love challenges like that. Anyway, and then there's the, the books, the websites, the teachers, the classes that you might really go, oh, I'd like to try that. So usually after I get the idea, then you have to think, how am I going to follow through with this? Well, most people would go to a store. I don't have to, I have a stash, as I'm sure everyone here does. You have your stash, so you go there. And you think, do I need a pattern or can I just start start this? And most of the time I just start, but every once in a while, like for instance, that Frank and Carmichael, or if I'm doing a portrait or a landscape, you know, a, a, a landscape that you recognize. Landscapes that aren't, are in my head, I can just wing, but landscapes that are actually something, like a mountain or Mount Cinnaboyne or Castle Mountain or you know, the something that people recognize, you have to draw a pattern, right? I have to draw a pattern. And I can't draw, which is hard to believe, but because I did go to art school for many, many years and I actually graduated, so, but I can't draw. So you cheat, right? That's a standard thing. And so I get a photograph, usually my photograph. If it's not my photograph, then you have to ask permission from whoever, right? And that sometimes takes a long time. For the Franklin Carmichael, all you do is you go to a group of seven. I just did a Lauren Harris that got into CQA. I don't know if you saw it. But anyway, um, all you do is go to a group of seven. You, there's a whole foundation. They just go, sure, go ahead, do whatever. It's great, you got the letter, you're fine. Anyway, okay, so, and while I'm doing this in my head, while I'm sort of thinking, okay, I'm sort of starting now, do I go literal or do I go abstract, right? Do I, well, in this show I went literal, but sometimes I do go abstract, but I take things pretty literal. Like if you give me a challenge, like threads of hope, I'm thinking thread, hope. I hope this thread lasts forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's pretty literal. <laughs> And, you know, and then I also did communication, but I'll talk about that later. Anyway, um, so what is the desired result? Do you want your quilt to em emanate? Sometimes I think about, do I want it to be calm, people to think calm, look at it and be calm. I want it to be people to think beautiful, mysterious. Um, I don't do political quilts. Uh, you know how some quilts, you get angry or, they, you know, they, they still, you know, you want to do something about it. I'm not that kind of quilter. I'd like to say I could be, but I, I tend to make things that are either pretty or funny or just sort of out there. I, I like humor. I like humor in quilts. It's, so, but you have to think of all this stuff. Um, so, um, like for instance, on the bias. We all have this challenge that we're supposed to do. And some of you I know have done them. Thank you very much. I'm not one of you. I have a, I'm a deadline oriented person. I will think about something for months and then I'll do it in the last three days before it's due. And, um, but then you have to think, okay, so let's go back. I'm starting the quilt now. Do I want to do intense work or do I want to go easy peasy? Do I want to spray, do I want to use spray glue, fuse, hand applique, no. Raw edge, real, you know, and then you please go out, okay. will I embellish, I even use threads, beads, ribbons, marking, painting, stamping, are you going to add mylar on top, are you going to add, I don't know, anything, you know, there's so much you can do. And then, so I'm gone, I'm starting, I'm doing it, it's laid out, it's there. I'm, I'm saying this like it's so easy. Right now I'm doing a commission for a dog. It's been in my head for, since December. It's brown. I went through all the brown fabrics. They're sitting there. They're brown, brown, brown. It's brown. So there's so many decisions, right? What kind of fabrics? What colors? Patterns or not? Solids? Mono? Color? I tend to like, I always do color. I have done beige once. I got over it. Um, and, and deadline. But in the end, you're going to do it for yourself. Even if it's a commission, 
I used to do it to please them, now I'm trying to please me. And it's really changed. Like I know this guy wants a brown dog. I'm pretty sure it's not gonna be completely brown, just because. But anyway, so I'm choosing the fabric, I'm starting. Some people like solids. I do not, I know they're really big right now, and I have a lot because, you know, you have to. <laughs> but I tend to you try and use, like if I'm doing a portrait, um, it's fun to get flowers or plaids or, you know, the unordinary. I like people look at my quilts and then look, you know, okay, don't use these as an example. Use my other ones <laughs> as examples. You know, I like details. I look to, I like to stick a frog in a kid's hair or, you know, something like that. It's just kind of interesting. And then when you actually, so you've got the whole thing down. I tend to usually do all my down and then I either quilt it to death or I put netting on top to hold everything down and then I quilt it. Occasionally, when I'm doing landscapes, I tend to start at the top and work down, work at the sky and go to the ground because you're always laying on the front to front and then you just do a little bit of stitching on top to hold everything down and then I quilt it like crazy. But then you've got the decision. What do you do? Do you do lace, couching, beading, do you add chenille? How do you finish? Okay, finishing. These are all fixed. And sometimes that's what you have to do because it's more art, right? If you're binding it, it's more of a quilt. And we had this discussion in, in uh, art school. You know, is it craft? Is it art? Is it, you know, what is it? And if you're going to sell it, well, of course, if you're going to sell it, it's going to be worth more if it's framed or on a canvas or stretched or... Uh, anyway, all of those questions you have to do. So, I'm just going to talk about this one, just to give you an example. I'm known for my portraits, right? I do lots of portraits. So, this one is easy. You take a black and white piece of newsprint, right? And I took the photo. I printed it in black and white. I just, this is my actual process for this one. <laughs> so I print it in black and white. I divide it into eight colors, white, black, dark, 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 medium, dark, light, dark, dark, light, light, medium, and light, light, right? You got them all? And then I just take my, I chose blue because I like blue. <laughs> and um, so I just, uh, Put all my blues on the table, sorted them into eight, and I just went from there and just, you know, marked it out and started. And then I always do the the face first, and then I look for a background. Sometimes, and usually I use a plain background because I don't want the background to overtake the the foreground. On the other hand, um, for instance, my mom was a music teacher, so I did her all in music. So I did lots of musical stuff behind her. My father, I made out of rocks and stones because he was a geologist. And so he had a very rocky background. With me, I want to show that I'm a quilter. So I did a traditional log cabin, and this is actually the first log cabin and the last log cabin I ever did. So that it tells you, it feels like a quilter. And um, yeah, so I guess that's what I did. But in this case, I, I wanted to bind it because I'm a, I like that. It makes me feel like, yes, this is a quilt. It's very soft. It's very whatever. And then you just sort of go. And then you just put it all down. And you move around and you change it. And you look at yourself. And you look at <laughs> and you're back and forth. And then you just put the netting on top and quilt and poof, done. So, questions? <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So, this is kind of a difficult question, perhaps. What do you do when you get stuck? Oh, you have to walk out of the room and <laughs> maybe have a glass of wine. Oh, okay, so what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah. Do you sometimes start another piece? Oh, you bet. You bet. If I get stuck, it's, you should see this dog. Just bring thoughts to life. It's, uh, it's sitting on there. I, I need a, a 10,000 piece squared, you know, one and a half inch block quilt while, while I've been doing this dog. You know, uh, you know, um, somebody came over to ask me about a Christmas quilt. Suddenly I had three Christmas quilts. I did them like two weeks ago. 
just because you're avoiding. I'm avoiding the so you're not dog. distracting yourself from the dog you're avoiding. Mm -hmm. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not three days before the due date, right? No, that's the problem. He didn't give me a date. <laughs> like I said, I can't even start on it until June, and I started it in June. So can you imagine making a dog portrait similar to how you made this woman? Oh, that's what I'll be doing. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'll be doing for sure. Yeah. And his face is definitely more interesting than the body. Like, yeah. uh, it's just no, it just as you were talking, I thought, is this one of the ways that you're? Solving the problem of the dog. It's well, like, it's it's definitely easier, right? Like I, I took a picture of the dog. I changed it to black and white right away, mm -hmm. and and then I and I asked him. I said, you know, how realistic do you want this? So how did you um, manage to keep the little piece of fabric in place before you put the? Sometimes I put a dab of glue. Sometimes I put a pin. I try not to use too much glue because it really doesn't number on your needles and yeah. fabric, and mm -hmm. it's kind of cheating. <laughs> do you fuse ever? I, I do everything. Okay. I try not to fuse too much. Number one, the cost. Number two, it's a pain to work with. I mean, to sew. Mm -hmm. um, it's. It, I feel like it's cheating a little bit. I don't mind the ragged edge. Mind you, I, I use netting on a lot. I stole the, that from a Susan Carlson. Mm -hmm. I'm a Susan Carlson fanatic. I, I'm just I'm in awe of her stuff. So, so how many layers would be like in her hair, for example, or how do you four manage that? Four or five. Okay. There's a lot. The eyes have a lot of layers. Eyes and mouths are really tough. So I'm trying to cut out and move back. And but they're fun. Like hair especially is fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My grandson's hair, you should see the stuff in his hair. Oh, got animals and cars and it's very cool. <laughs> Sounds really cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So yeah. So I mean I've tried every technique I I can. Like this cheesecloth thing, I was just going, wow, this is inexpensive, it's easy, it's fun, it's just you can do anything. I love cheesecloth, you know, and I love things being more, um, like some quilting is very expensive, mm -hmm. and uh, cheesecloth is so, um, what's the word I want? M more people can do it, because they can afford it. Accessible. Accessible, thank you, that's the word I want, yes. Yeah, it's just more accessible, and, and it's easy to do, and it's fun, and you know, it's like the dyeing, you can use the expensive dyes, or you can use tea bags, or Kool-Aid. Especially the non triplos kind. <laughs> so, anyway, it's kind of fun, and uh, yeah. So I t that's my process. And when it's, but the problem is, how do you know when it's done? And that's the problem. That's why deadlines are good because oh, it's due at twelve o'clock. It's done. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Take the picture. Good. <laughs> like I put my quilts into Harris Park every year, and they're always phoning me at seven o'clock. Well, six thirty. Margaret, seven o'clock is coming pretty soon. I'm binding, I'm binding, I'm on my way. <laughs> so, and, oh, another thing I always want to say, labels are super important. Put the name, date, place, year. Very important, very important. Show us your label. Oh, well, there, it's just a computer label, which is sort of cheating because I can do six at once, which is really nice. And this is from the Alberta Quilt Discovery Project, which is also a good idea. If you have a quilt you're proud of, or you know, or just is different. Get it right. Get it registered for heaven's sakes. It doesn't cost you much, and it's kind of fun. It's kind of Sorry, nice. Sorry, where where do you register your quilt? Online, the Alberta Quilt Discovery Project. They they measure your quilt. They assess your quilt. They can tell you know that you can bring your great grandmother's quilts or a quilt you found, and they'll you know register it. Mm -hmm. They're trying to register every quilt in Alberta. Okay. But. After the after my first twenty, they're going okay, Margaret. You can slow down now. All right. That I, there was a talk by um, Lucy Hines, mm -hmm. um, who's who used to live in Edmonton. She's living outside the city now, but she's a curator at the Royal Alberta Museum. Yeah, yeah. And she was part of the Alberta Quilt Project, and she mentioned four different groups that are doing registration yeah. of quilts. Is that yeah. one of them? Yeah. They, the Alberta Quilt Discovery started quite a while ago, maybe 20 years ago, right? And
and they've been working ever since, but now there's other groups that have sort of expanded on it, which is really great, because we need to know some history. But, you know, I mean, we all have old quilts, and, you know, let's get them registered, for heaven's sakes. There's a lot of good stories there. I know, I meander, I change subjects a lot. I've tried everything, I don't really have a thing, but if you think of me, you probably think of my portraits, my kids, my, you know, stuff like that. But I tend to do everything. Anyway, well, thank I'm you. Well, I'm sure that most of us here have stepped through the same process that Margaret has described in her, in her talk today with, you know, trying different things, deciding if you're going to wing it or what techniques you're going to use. And of course, is it done, right? Because that's often what, uh, what we're faced with at the end. Does it need anything more? And they usually does. Yeah. Do you um, look at it after it's come back from wherever it's been shown and you look at it and you go, oh, I know what it needs. All the time. Okay, good. So mm -hmm. see, I do that Very too. And I'll bet, I'll bet yes. a number of you do the same thing when you have yeah. it home and you're not so emotionally attached one way or the other, and you're looking at it and go, "Of course, it needs this." Well, I know if I just spent another day on it, or just done this, or yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. I know. Well, that's part of the learning, right? Yeah. I guess in some ways we're never done with them, mm. even though we think they're done. Well, and I've gone back to quotes ten years later and added. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because remember in those days, well, twenty years ago. Quilts, you quilted this far apart. Now you quilt this far apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it adds new life. It, it, it certainly does. It certainly does. It certainly does. Are there any further questions from anyone for either Marie or Mark? I have a one for Marie. And it, it's about your mark making. Mm -hmm. and do you like to mix your medias when you're doing mark making? I noticed you have some with paper and cloth that you were showing us. I do, and I'm changing even more. So. I mean, the Threads of Hope piece was made quite a few years ago with just um, paint. And now you're right, I do like mixing both paint and dye. And also now adding paper and marking pens. And that lunch Yvonne also got me very excited about using felt with paper. So um, that's, I, I'll never be a, an expert at it, but I think it's neat to incorporate that too, so yes. And so would you layer them, or do you just, yes. would you just make a piece? No, I, I'm going to layer, like um, Allison and I were talking about my uh, On the Bias piece, and it's going to be layered. And so I can't work like Margaret because I need oh, time. We are, we are so opposite, yes, it's crazy. totally opposite. <laughs> I'm done ahead of time, she's last minute. <laughs> But also, uh, on my on the bias, like my first layer is paint, so it has to dry and sort of cure before I do the next layer. Yeah. So, yeah. And I would, I would just keep going, yeah, no matter what. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> You're just totally off the yeah. set. She's, she's great to work with because I'm an abstract person, I'm an idea person, where she's the detail person. <laughs> we work pretty well together. That would do amazing work. <laughs> and, and do either of you use a sketchbook? Like you say, I, you I own sketchbooks. I have some beautiful sketchbooks. <laughs> yes. I also, so uh, during COVID, what was that person's name? Lisa Call had a sketchbook ch challenge. So Allison and I signed up for it. Well, my sketchbook is four pages, and now it's just writing and stuff. So I use my sketchbook more for ideas. Versus, I'm not a good, like Margaret, I'm not a good sketcher. I'm more, like, really rough. So this is more your idea. Yeah. Launch. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I can't, uh, Allison's very good at sketching. And, and what about you, Margaret? Do you draw your own ideas at all? I do, I draw lots, actually. Okay. I, have so lots, draw I have lots of sketchbooks. Okay. I have some beautiful ones that are too pretty to write in, but I do have a lot. Yeah, I, I have, I pick them up all the time. Whenever I go to a, a fan conference, I'll be, I'll come home with 50 pages of ideas. You know, and, and I tend to write things, but mostly it's just, if I draw it, then it'll get in my head. Yeah. Oh, I, I have so many, I, I can't live enough, long enough to do all the things I want to do. Same, so I get 
divert it, like I'm working on something, I started a series on mountains, well, I, I, you, all, you worry about your mind because you sort of get bored with it and on to something else, <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a common yeah. occurrence. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, when that happens to me sometimes, and the deadline is looming, it's like, okay, Sharon, this is your job today is yeah. to get to this step, right? <laughs> you have to get to this step in order to meet the deadline. So you can daydream about this other project or that other lovely technique you'd like to try another time, but right now you've got to do the work, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Do the work, which is a phrase actually that came up over and over again in, um, in a course that I took quite a few years ago called Seriously Creative, where when it yeah, came down do to work. it, you have to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I find the hardest part is starting. Mm -hmm. you, like, I think about it way too long. Yeah. And when, once I'm going, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But it's getting starting. Like, once that dog looks like a dog, I'll be fine. But right now, it doesn't. Just a blob of brown. It's brown. <laughs> there are phases. I feel like there's phases. Like in the beginning, this is awesome. This is great. Ooh, this is difficult. <laughs> and, then, and then it's, this is, this is bad. Yeah. Calling this is awesome. This is awesome. Wow. Do you think sometimes we make things more difficult for ourselves? All, all the time. Sharon, you know that. But, but you know, I always, when I get stuck sometimes, I think about what other artists would do. And when it comes to color, oh, I, never think that. I often think about Fred Barley. Oh! He painted that woman with a green face. I love that and green face. And it's not the first thing you notice about that painting. What you notice are her features more than anything. Wow. But she's got to have a face that's green. Mm -hmm. And it's really green. It's like, yeah. I'm green, right? So, so there are tricks, I yeah. guess, that artists use to communicate emotion or personality yeah. or... Well, I do like to copy exactly. other artists just to see. Yeah. Like, you know, I've done a, a few Canadian artists, and I've done a few, um, uh, you know, Monet, Matisse, Van Gogh, um, Rembrandt, Da Vinci, I've tried them all, right? Because I like them, I like to try them. You know, I not, they're not fiber artists, um, right? Oh yeah, but, but they're using the principles of art, and but you're it's kind of using fun. the same thing, yeah. but in a different medium. Yeah, so. I mean, I do have the degree, I really maybe, should use it, maybe right? Maybe you need to try a Fred Barley. I, maybe. There you go. There you go. My next challenge. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> anyway, you know, well, thank, thanks for giving me the opportunity to add her. But uh, like the Trudy says, I really just wing it. <laughs> well, you got something going on. Yeah. Uh, you're, winning, right. you're, you're making good choices. So. Well, making fun choices. Yeah, it's good. Any other questions for Mark or Marie? Well, thank you very much, Marie oh. and Mark. The show's great. I'm thrilled we're here because just sitting here, oh my God, I want to look at I'm all glad the show this. is here. It's stunning. It's stunning.